As tonight, as we remember, as we remember, as done for us, Christ done for us. I mean, you can't help but think how glory He is. Glory He is. That that was our punishment. That that was our punishment. He took it for us. He took it for us. So as we get into the time of worship, we get into the time of worship. Be thankful for what He has done for you. For what He has done for you. While you're still sinning. While you're still sinning. He was on the cross. He knew exactly the thing He did. Exactly the thing He did. Jesus, I pray, Father God, Lord Jesus, I pray, Father, as we God, remember, as we remember us, what you've done for us. The one thing that really sits here, one thing that really sits here, sits out to me is that you're not still on the cross. You're not still on the cross. But you're alive and well. But you're alive and well. You literally took, you literally took death and Hades and hell and self and Hades and hell for us. For us. Father God, whoever came in here right now, whoever is here, wherever a walk of life they're at right now, right now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, illuminate, 
illuminate the thoughts, the the, the, the scriptures, the, the what you've done for them, what you've God. done for them, Father God. So, Lord Jesus, thank you so, so much. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. We uplift you. We honor you. We uplift you. We, honor we acknowledge you. you. You've been the we room. You. You've been the room. So, Lord, so Lord, thank you so much. Thank you. You so are much. absolutely worthy you are absolutely of the praise and worship. Praise and worship. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey guys, amen. Amen. Uh, join amen. us in worship. Uh, join us in worship.
Luke 20, 23, 26. 26. As, as they, they led, led him away, away they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was, was on his way in from the country, and, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind, behind Jesus. As Simon woke up that morning, it would be a day in history he would never forget. He began his preparations to go to Jerusalem for the Passover events. Thousands of Jews would converge on that city to celebrate the feast of Passover. Simon had longed for this event, a chance to visit Jerusalem. Kissing his wife goodbye and hugging his sons, he began his journey. The crowd grew larger that day, and the Roman soldiers were out in full force. Maybe there was a rumor of a Jewish uprising. As Simon entered the outskirts of Jerusalem, he heard the noise of the multitudes. He began to hear shouts of cursing and the crack of the Roman whip. He began to see the women weeping as he drew closer. This was supposed to be a sacred Passover. What could this be? What could this be? Making his way through the crowd, his eyes fastened on a man falling beneath a cross. His body was bruised and covered in blood. This man was weak and unable to carry the cross. He was on his way to be crucified. He was probably a criminal or a murderer, as this punishment was reserved for such. Suddenly, the hands of Roman soldiers seized Simon. Bear their cross, cross snapped the soldier. Simon tried to resist, but the hands tightened upon him. He had no choice but to bear the blood-stained cross for the criminal. Many thoughts perhaps raced through his mind. Why should he get mixed up in the crucifixion of a criminal? Why did the soldiers pick on him? What would his family say? Simon bent low and put his shoulder under the cross. The eyes of the criminal kept staring at him. Simon could feel the blood on the cross. This wasn't going to be easy to do. What? He heard the women weeping as they followed along. At one moment, the criminal stopped and looked to the women. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the bearer and the wounds that never bear and those who cannot nurse. Then shall they say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. What does this mean? What is he saying? Such eloquent words. What kind of criminal is this? They were at Golgotha by now, the place of the skull. What a relief. Three men were put on a cross that day as Simon watched. The soldiers were nailing something over the head of the one whose cross he just carried. It looks like a sentence in three different languages. This is, is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ of, of Nazareth, Nazareth, the King, King of, of the, the Jews. Jews. Wait. That name sounds familiar, Simon thought. This is the man I heard rumors about. This is the man, they say, healed the sick and raised the dead. This man is no criminal. Why are they nailing him to a cross? The sky grew dark as the wind began to blow across the mountains. The darkness continued for three hours. It was a strange darkness. 
the body of Jesus moved. His lips quivered as he said, Father, Father into, into thy hands, hands I, I commend, commend my, my spirit. spirit. The ground shook as the rocks were split asunder. A Roman centurion cried out, Truly, this, this was, was the Son, Son of, God. of God. Simon continued his week in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. During this time, he had heard many things about this Jesus. He even heard that Jesus arose from the dead. Many of his disciples and followers confirmed it, seeing him on many different occasions. The grave was empty. Truly, this was the Messiah of Israel. Simon told his family about his experience in Jerusalem. What seemed his most humiliating experience turned out to be the greatest event in his entire life. He had borne the cross of the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. What an honor. Simon and his family became followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Simon had two sons, Rufus and Alexander. Thirty years later, Alexander became a Christian martyr. And the Apostle Paul mentions Rufus in Romans 16, 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. The family of Simon was saved because of what he did that day at Jerusalem. The, the cross, cross of Jesus, Jesus changed, changed their lives. We welcome you tonight to this Good Friday service, and we have come and we have gathered to worship, to remember, to recognize, and again, just to, to worship the Lord from on high. God has done great and mighty things, and we are here to celebrate this, this weekend again, the goodness and the amazing love of our Heavenly Father. The truth is this, the gospel is this, that God gave. Jesus came. He lived on this earth a perfect life, and he gave himself as a sacrifice for mankind's sin, that we might be saved from our sin, that we might be set free from our sin, and that we might know the precious gifts of salvation and eternal life. Although this weekend we celebrate not a Lord that is dead, because he did rise three days later tonight, we remember his sacrifice. Tonight we remember all that the Lord has done for us. So, Father, we, we just take this moment, Lord, and as we, as we come to your word, Lord, and as we would prepare our hearts tonight to worship, as we prepare our hearts, Lord, to come to the communion table, to declare, uh, Lord, ourselves, your children, Lord, to declare that you are great and you do miracles, that you deserve all of the glory, to declare that, Lord, there was nothing we could do to save ourselves, but, Father, you provided, you made a way for us. So tonight, we've come to worship you. We've come to honor you. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in this gathering, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. There is a story that I'm sure many of you have probably heard at different times. In fact, it's been a long time since I have heard the story or read the story, and I felt led to share it with us this evening. It's a story called The Bridge. It's a story of great sacrifice, and the story goes like this. There once was a bridge operator who had a young son, a son whom he dearly loved. In fact, they were inseparable. They were very close. And this young boy would often ask his father if he could go with him to work, if, if he could go and watch him work. His father worked on a line where he raised and he lowered bridges for trains to go back and forth. 
he would lower the drawbridge and allow boats to pass, passenger trains to come by. Well, one day the father decided to relent and he let his son, after his request, he let his son go with him to work. And the story goes like this. The father warned the boy, said, stay here at a safe distance and don't go anywhere else without talking to me. While I go and I raise the bridge for the boats that are coming. So the boy stayed where his father had left him and he watched the bridge as it slowly lifted up in the sky. Suddenly, the boy heard this faint sound and an approaching passenger train is what he thought, coming quite a bit sooner than it was scheduled to come. The father was up in the control room. He couldn't hear anything. He didn't hear the whistle of the train. He didn't hear the warning of his son who was waving, didn't see it or hear him at all. The boy saw the train, saw it getting closer and closer, and decided that he was going to disobey his father, that he was, going to, he was going to run along the platform, try to get to his father so that he could warn him and let him know. He also knew that there was a lever, the story says, that he could pull that was near the operation gears. So the boy instead ran to that door, and as he went there on the platform, he started to lower himself down so that he could pull that, and he lost his balance, the story says. And he fell into where the gears came together, and he was stuck. He was caught. At the same time, the father saw his son fall down into the hole in the platform. He saw the fast approaching train, and in horror, he had realized that if he didn't start lowering the bridge immediately, that this passenger train that was coming, was they were going to die. They would, it would end up going down into the river below. Innocent people. Hundreds of innocent people dying, falling to their death. The man was faced with this incredible dilemma. What does he do? What will his choice be? Race to save his son at the cost of hundreds of lives or sacrifice his son to save the passengers on the train? And as many of you know in reading the story, we know that he made the choice, the only choice that he could have really made. He pulled the lever to lower the bridge. And the story, this true story, records that in spite of the noise of the descending bridge and the oncoming train, he could hear the anguished screams of his beloved son as he was crushed to death between these gears. The father ran to the platform as the train was passing by. Most people on the train simply ignored the man who was crying on the platform. Others looked out the window and stared totally into oblivion. Again, here's an unspeakable sacrifice that is just taking place, but none of them know it. None of them realized they gave no thought to what had just taken place, that a father had just given his most precious gift to save the life of of others. At the end of that story, there's a phrase that was written, and it says, the sacrifice of one offered life to all. There are so many similarities in that story when we look to the amazing love of our Heavenly Father. There's a verse of Scripture that I'd love for us to read together tonight, if we'd bring it up on the screen. Again, coming from Romans 8.32, would you read together with me? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Oh, that sounds really good. Let's do it one more time. You guys are good at this. Here we go. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Paul asks a question that is here, and the answer is obvious within this verse of Scripture. He says, if God gave us his son, then will he not give us everything else that he has promised, everything else that you and I need? 
Now, when we think about our Heavenly Father and we think about that He is all-knowing, He is, again, His, His love is everlasting. When we think about His goodness and His grace and His mercy and His power, we, we, we see that God is tremendous. But you and I know that when it comes to everyday life, there are moments and times where we would agree and say, yes, I know God is sovereign. Yes, I know God is powerful. Yes, I know God is forgiven. But in the midst of our circumstance or our trial or our situation, there are moments and there are times where we question and we wonder, is it God's will? Is God going to be good to me in this moment, in this circumstance? Will he be sufficient for this need? How is he going to work good in the midst of that that seems so hard, that that seems so difficult? But what Paul writes here in this verse of Scripture, again, that encourages you and encourages me, simply this, if God has given us his beloved son, why wouldn't he give us everything else that we need as well? The great sacrifice, the greatest love ever been expressed. In Paul's words, here in this verse of Scripture, again, it says, He who did not spare his own son. Now, again, this, this word spare and that phrase would probably have been familiar to many of God's people in that day. For this is the same wording, the same phrase, the same meaning that is spoken of, of Abraham the patriarch in the Old Testament. When Abraham was going to sacrifice his son going to sacrifice the promised one. We know in the story that again God provided a ram caught in the thicket, that again Abraham didn't have to sacrifice a son because God provided. And you and I know tonight as we gather in this place to worship on this Good Friday and to remember the cross of Calvary and all that God has done, that God provided the perfect sacrifice. He provided the lamb, the lamb that was slain, the lamb that <laughs> shed blood that you and I might be forgiven of our sins and we might know the peace and the joy of God that we might know the gifts of salvation and eternal life. What a picture we see here of Jesus Christ here in the same mountain range of Moriah, the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice, but also the place where the Lamb of God gave his life on Calvary for you and for me. If God was willing to do that for us, then why would he not be willing to do anything and everything that you and I might experience life and life more abundantly? That you and I might know the goodness of our God. Somebody once asked a theologian, what is the most important word in the Scripture in the Bible? Some people thought and it spoke some other words to him and said, it's love, it's love, it's all about God's love or it's forgiveness. And he said, no, 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 that's not what I'm thinking. That's not where my mind goes. And he said, the most important word is the word for in the Greek, in the Greek, for is hooper, meaning in place of. In place of. The truth is this man was lost and dead in his trespasses and sin. There was nothing that any of us could do to save ourselves. But God in his great love for you and for me. <laughs> He gave Jesus in place of us. We know the wages of sin is death. We know that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God provided the perfect sacrifice in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and willingly gave his life so that you and I might live. That you and I might be saved. Wow. Wow. If you were thinking about this in light of the scripture, God delivered his son over for all of us that you and I might be saved. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. But let me take it just one step further for us tonight as we consider the cross of Calvary. We go to the scripture and we remember that the scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
It's not just the focus and the fact that God gave his son as a sacrifice for our sin. See, sometimes we, when we think about that, it was, well, you know, he must have saw the good things that were in us, right? Or, or it's because we, because we were, did things right. It's because we're his friends, but the reality is we were all lost. Christ, when he gave his life on the cross of Calvary, my friends, we were known at that point in time as enemies of God. But because of the shed blood of Christ, the shed blood of Christ, because Jesus came and paid that price, it makes God's gift even richer. It makes it even more amazing. While we were in sin, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Wow. So I come back to Paul's statement in the scripture as we read it. He who would not spare his own son, how would he not give us what we need? How would he not give to us his promises? How would he not give us everything we need for life and for godliness? Friends, the truth is this. When we look to the cross of Calvary, it's a reminder to us of God's amazing love. God's amazing love. God will move on our behalf. God knows everything that's going on about our lives. And we can look to the cross and we can be lifted and faith can arise and we can believe him. Not having to give place to doubt, but we can have confidence because his love says to us, God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. God's love for you, God's love for me is great. In a few moments, we're going to be coming to these tables to partake of communion. And I know some of you already grabbed your communion, so don't worry about that. That's okay. If you take a second one, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> Just bring it with you when you come. But our leadership, our pastors and our deacons and spouses, we're going to come and there'll be a couple on each side of each of these tables. And there's some back there in the middle if you need to get to one that's closer. But as you come, we will invite you to come to be served, to partake of communion. And then we want to pray with you. We want to believe with you. We know that God's love for you, God's love for us is great. And we want to encourage you tonight as we remember the cross of Calvary that we serve a heavenly father that will not withhold any good thing from his children. We want you to remember and to be encouraged that he is the one who has directed us in his word to cast all our cares on him for he cares for us. We believe that just as Jesus was glorified through the cross of Calvary and the resurrection of the dead, that tonight he desires to glorify himself in your life, in your circumstance, to glorify himself during this season as we celebrate his amazing love and his amazing, amazing grace. I want you to think about something with me for a moment. You know, the people that were on that train, most of them were totally unaware of the sacrifice that took place. I remember one of the stories, one of these stories or of this story that I read, probably something that was, you know, written again by somebody else or whatever, but it had talked about the father yelling as the train passed by, don't you realize I gave my son for you? The appropriate response when we gather on a Good Friday or when we come together in worship or even as we go before the Lord each and every day is to remember and to have a thankful heart, to thank him and to worship him. Tonight, you and I have options as we come and we partake of the bread representing his body and the cup representing his shed blood. We have the choice. We can thank him. We can honor him. We can worship him. Or we could be like those on the train who 
who ignored him, who turned or were not even aware of the gift. I want you to know that God wants each one of us to know of his love and to celebrate that. We can also, as we come to partake of communion in our worship and in our expression, it's a great time for us to even reprioritize when we recognize that such a gift really demands a response, doesn't it? Such a love that is, that is expressed should be returned as we pledge our lives to serve him, to live for him. We also, too, my friends, <laughs> remembering again with the scripture that if God did not spare his own son but gave him for us, that you and I can trust and we can believe that God is working everything for our good that as we call upon him, he will be faithful to hear, and he will meet us in our times of need, in our times of need. And if you are here tonight, and maybe you've not entered into a personal relationship with Jesus, maybe you have not received the gift of salvation, I want you to know it's a free gift. It's a free gift. The Father gave there was nothing again that we could do to save ourselves. So God provided the lamb to pay the price that you and I might be saved. I would encourage you to come to the communion table or to one of the couples that are there and just tell them that you want to know Jesus. And they would love to pray with you and lead you into a personal relationship with the Lord. Know this. He loves you so much that he gave his son. He wants you to know him. And he wants you to live in his love. Again, that the fruit of your life would be, would bless his name and proclaim his name to all the earth. God is good. God is sovereign. And God loves you and he loves me. And tonight, we celebrate that. I'm going to ask that you would prepare your hearts as if you turn your attention towards the screen Let's prepare our hearts to worship and to receive communion. And in a moment, Pastor Ted will be coming. But let's worship the Lord. The tree of life. God's promise to the people he loves. And he pursued us. We like sheep went astray again and again. But he pursued us relentlessly. When we sinned, he offered a sacrifice. When we rebelled, he sent us a savior. But we spit in his face. And our God took that tree of life, made it into a cross, and allowed us to crucify his son. His arms spread as branches to cover the sin of the world. All my sin placed upon his shoulders. All my shame becomes his thorny crown. From his head, hands and feet so Yeah. 
It was finished. The wages of sin for you and me were paid in full. No last fragment of guilt or shame or shred of a filthy rag of earned righteousness was left. It was finished. And the Savior breathed his final breath. It is finished. of the glory and the honor and Lord we lift our heads in worship as we lift your holy name and you deserve the glory and the honor Lord we lift our heads in worship as we lift your holy name Cause you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, for you are great, and you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no You deserve the glory, and you deserve the glory and the honor. So, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name, and you deserve the glory and the honor. And, Lord, we lift our hands in worship. As we lift your holy name, cause you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, for you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Yes, there's no one else like you. Father, tonight is a night to remember, to look back, and to remember the pain and the agony and the anguish that you went through to pay the price for my sins, for the sins that are here. But Lord, it's not only a day to look back, but it's also a day to look forward and a day of thanksgiving, a day to say thank you, Lord, for what you accomplished upon that cross. How cruel, how ugly, how horrible it was but yet on the same token, how beautiful and how awesome, how glorious, because there you paid the supreme sacrifice. But today we want to say thank you, Lord. Lord, you're worthy. As we sang the song this evening, the, this chorus tonight, Lord, you deserve the glory. Truly tonight, you deserve all glory, all power, all honor, Thank you, Lord, for what you accomplished for us. Tonight, as we prepare our hearts and prepare for communion tonight, Lord, we want to remember what you did. We want to remember all that you went through, but also we want to remember that you did it for us. You did it for me. You did it for each and every individual that is here this evening. And Lord, as we as often as we drink this cup and eat this bread, or we show forth your death until you come. And Lord, truly, it is a day of thanksgiving. Praise God. We're going to encourage our, our staff and board members to come and
They're going to be at tables here at the front, two on the side, two back there. And we're going to encourage you to come as, as family units to one of these tables and just wait for, you know, a clearing there and just come. We want to have communion with you. We want to pray with you. And we want to believe with you for God's blessings upon your life.